In the name of the risen Christ, amen. Sometimes we just have to move toward the light while it's still dark. Sometimes we have to move toward love, even when we don't feel it. We have to move toward life, even if it feels like we're going through the motions of life because we don't feel it anymore. Moving toward light when it's still dark is awkward and it's tentative, but there are times when we simply need to move. We have to go. And on that first Easter Eve, early morning, it was the women of Jesus' inner circle who moved. They, they went first. Not that they had any idea that that's what they were doing. They rose that night from the stupor of grief, fully expecting to anoint a dead body. That's how it works. Someone hears something in the middle of the night and gets up and moves. And in the movement, something happens and the dawn breaks. And, and if you notice, it's a, it's a collective experience. Like it's happening for a bunch of people, but someone has to go first and make a path so others can follow. So they did. And what they experienced was beyond credulity. And so they said nothing to anyone of what they heard and saw because they were afraid. Well, so says that text. But eventually they did tell somebody, despite their fear, no doubt struggling to believe what the young man had told them as much as those first listening to that bizarre story. There's another version, there's a lot of versions of this story, by the way. In one of them, the young man who spoke at the tune, he becomes an angel. And then another, you remember, it's Jesus himself who appears in the garden, rather than telling them to go to Galilee to meet him there. And there's another version where the men eventually show up at the tomb, after the women, just saying. In another, the, those men gather together in fear in the same room where they had shared their final meal with Jesus. And in another, you remember, there were two of the men who were so bereft, they simply had to move, but they went out of town, walking toward another town called Emmaus. And then there was one more that we know of where they all go back to Galilee, as Jesus said, and they resume their previous lives as fishermen. So all these variations of the earliest accounts of when Jesus shows up, um, and for all the differences, there's this one common thread. He appears to them after the resurrection. He appears to them in ways that are otherworldly in the sense that he wasn't resuscitated, you know? Um, he was alive, but it wasn't like before, and everybody knows that. But at the very same time, these appearances are strikingly mundane. He shows up as they're going through the motions of life, which made it all rather frightening and wonderful and strangely normal. I can't speak to you from personal experience about what happened back then. Um, and I don't know what happens, personal experience. I don't know what happens on the other side of death. But this I know, that on this side 
of that final crossing over. Resurrection happens when it happens in the midst of life. Something or someone dies. And with that something or someone, a part of us does too. We die. And for a while, sometimes a very long time, we live as though dead ourselves. And if the loss is deep enough, well, that's just fine with us. And resurrection is this mysterious process of life emerging again out of that death. And it always begins really small in a very dark hour, a seed of light and life somehow stirs and we get up. And before we know what's happening, we're moving toward what lies ahead. Now to anybody watching us, we're just going about our day and we are but something's changed, and we know it. To have faith in this mysterious process doesn't require us casting a blind eye to all that is not or has not yet been touched by it. In other words, we don't have to pretend that the world isn't on fire, and we know even now, tonight, as we gather here in relative safety, others are huddled in fear and fear for their lives. And we know this. And we have to hold that grief for them and our own grief um, with us now. And we don't have to surrender our confusion, even anger, in the face of all that we don't understand. It's not required of us. So this afternoon, I was speaking on the telephone with an old friend, someone I've known and loved for over 30 years. She and her family were active in the very first congregation I served as a priest. This was back in Toledo, Ohio, in the first five years of my ordained life. And she, she is our younger son's godmother. And so after we were catching up on family and other things, I asked her what her plans were for Easter. And she said, oh, and by the way, she stopped going to church a long time ago, and, and I knew that. Um, and she said, well, this wasn't the conversation I was planning on having with my friend, the bishop, this weekend. But since you asked, I need to tell you that of all the Christian holidays, this is the one I really struggle with. I just don't know what to do with this notion or make sense of this notion that Jesus died for our sins. I mean, it doesn't bother me to be around people for whom it does make sense. I think she was talking about me. But it's a real stumbling block, she said, and I've been thinking about it all weekend. I was just asking her who she was having over for dinner, right? <laughs> and I was talking to her in my car. And I wasn't, and so finally I said rather lightheartedly, well, you know, you're the very first person I've met to struggle with this. <laughs> I'm so glad you laughed. Um, she, she did too, which was good. But then I assured her that this was a subject of intense debate within Christianity throughout the ages. And as a result, there's a lot of material and a lot of ways to think about Jesus' death and our sin. Um, and I was making a mental catalog of all the helpful articles I would send to her. Um, and then I, then I stopped for myself and, um, and I said, you know, but before we have this conversation, it would really help me to know what you mean when you say Jesus died for our sins. Like what it is about that phrase that you're struggling with because even that phrase means very different things to different people. Well, by then I'd meet, met my, reached my destination and we had to stop. Um, but I've been thinking about her, obviously, since then, and it occurred to me 
that there was one story in particular that best expresses my understanding of what that phrase, Jesus died for our sins, means. And it doesn't speak to me intellectually, um, but poetically. It doesn't answer all the questions I have, but it never fails to speak to my heart and, and to my experience. So I decided I was going to tell you this story tonight. And in doing so, I honor a, a very dear friend who has since died, who shared it with me years ago. It's not my story, but it, it feels like mine. That's how deeply it speaks to me of forgiveness and love and what Jesus makes possible for us. So this is for you, Perry Epps. The story is found in a trilogy, The Seed and the Sower, written by the South African author Lawrence Vanderpost. And it begins with the haunting confession of a young British soldier. I had a brother once, and I betrayed him. He goes on, the betrayal in itself was so slight that most people would find betrayal too exaggerated a word. Yet as one recognizes the nature of the seed from the tree and the tree by its fruit and the fruit by the taste on the tongue, so I know the betrayal from its consequences and the tyrannical flavor it left behind in my emotions. So as you can see straight away, this is a tale of shame. The shame that this young man who was blessed with physical beauty and intelligence felt toward his brother, who was, in contrast, slightly deformed, quiet, and self-conscious. His brother's only gift, it seemed, was that of song, hardly anything in comparison to the other's many talents. Few noticed this gift, and even it became a source of curiosity among other boys. And the young man felt his younger, the, 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 the narrator felt his brother's deformity as an embarrassment, as a threat to his own identity. And so while he was on the surface of their relationship, very protective and affectionate inside, he felt resentful. And the time came for the brother to join him at boarding school, and when the hazing rituals began, humiliating experience for any boy, his brother was particularly humiliated and scorned. And he felt that he ought to say something, but he did nothing but watch from a distance, avoiding his brother's increasingly desperate eyes that searched for him in the mocking crowds. And afterwards, he made light of his brother's pain, and they never spoke of it again nor did his brother ever sing again. Years pass, and during World War II, the older brother finds himself in Palestine as a soldier in the British Army, and he meets an old priest who becomes his friend. And the priest tells him that every year at Easter, he walks the seven-mile walk between Jerusalem and Emmaus to remember Jesus' Jesus' encounter with the two disciples on the road. I walk only at night, the priest tells him, to remind myself of all the ways I fail to recognize Jesus in the daylight of my life. That Easter night, the soldier joins him. It was an unremarkable experience. But afterwards, he became quite ill with a recurring bout of malaria. Fevered and hallucinating, he dreams of the resurrected one on the road. Where is Judas? Jesus asks in the dream. We can't go on without him, Jesus says in prayer to God. And the soldiers listened as the other disciples explained to Jesus that Judas was dead, that he hanged himself in shame. And Jesus responds by looking up to heaven, this cannot be. If I fail at this, 
I fail at all else besides, his deed, too, must be redeemed. Then the man who's having the dream, in his dream, steps forward. I am Judas. Jesus smiles. Good. Now we both can be free. But I'm not free, the man confessed. I had a brother once, and I betrayed him. Jesus nod, nods with understanding and kindness. Then you must go to your brother and make your peace with him, even as I have had to do with my need for you. So on the next furlough, the man travels back to South Africa, finds his brother on their family farm, and acknowledges his guilt. The brother marveled, you came all the way here simply to say this to me? And when the soldier left to return to his military post, he heard his brother sing. And what I love about this story and why it speaks to me of Jesus dying for our sins isn't, it's not that it ends with such a satisfying reconciliation. Um, that rarely happens for me. Um, but what I love is uh, Jesus' question, where is Judas? And his insistence to God, we cannot go on with this without him. And I love the fact that this accomplished brother carried in his soul all his life the secret of his guilt, and it was there in that dark place that no one, save the priest, I suppose, who heard his confession, could see. And that's where Jesus met him and set him free. And I love that forgiveness comes with a path of restitution, a way to at least try to make things right as we can and to place ourselves in the work of rising, helping others to rise too. So yeah, I believe that Jesus died for our sins, but I also believe he rises for us rises for us and invites us to rise with him and to be a person of faith and hope and love in this world is a daily practice of small steps moving toward life in the service of life as we're going about our days even if it isn't the life we wanted or imagined even if we have done the worst possible thing, it's a grace that meets us where we are, but doesn't leave us there. It's an assurance of Christ's presence and in the heart of God that will never let us go and invites us to move toward him, toward life, and taking our part in the great mystery of resurrection. <laughs>